Hi everyone, I'm Samyukta Mankumar, and I'd like to warmly welcome you back here to the Global Close for the Under One Sky Conference of 2023. In the past 24 hours, we've heard from people all over the world about topics including wildlife, astrotourism, astrophotography, lighting policy, and so much more. Throughout the past day, we've not only celebrated our shared passion for the night sky, but also forged connections that transcend geographical boundaries. So a little bit of admin before we get into this session. Closed captioning is enabled for the session and you can also get captions in other languages. You can access the closed captioning and translation by clicking on the CC button uh, on your toolbar menu on Zoom and the little arrow lets you access more options and set your preferred language. Please feel free to talk to each other and comment using the chat feature. If you have questions for the speaker, um, make sure you put these into the Q&A feature, not the chat. And just a quick reminder about the code of conduct, which you would have agreed to before joining this conference. This will help make this session a comfortable experience for everyone joining. So in case you want to review the code of conduct, it will be in the attendee package that you received when you registered for the conference. Also, if you missed a session today, or if you would like to rewatch something, all of the webinar and workshop recordings are posted under each session in the attendee hub. To find them, just select the session that you want to watch. Uh, click on the show password button and then copy the shown passcode. Then click on the watch recording button and paste the password into the box. And you'll be able to download both the video and the chat files from the session. If you haven't already, please say hello in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. And now I would like to introduce Karen Trevino from the US National Park Service. 
Karen has spent 18 years with the U.S. National Park Service, and she currently heads the NPS Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. She supports parks and partners in preserving acoustic and photic environments and has an active involvement in various advisory groups related to environmental and aviation noise. Additionally, Karen resides in Colorado and enjoys outdoor activities, cooking, and spending time with friends and family. Over to you, Karen. Great, thank you, Sam. And many thanks to Ruskin and Tom Reiner and the rest of the Dark Sky Board and everyone else who's worked so hard to make this conference a success, especially Betty Maya, whose amazing technological skills continue to amaze me. Um, so as Sam mentioned, my name is Karen Trevino and I have the privilege of leading the National Park Service Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. Not only do I have one of the best job titles in the world, I also happen to work for one of the best organizations in the world. The National Park Service preserves the natural lightscapes and the nighttime environment in national parks in order to provide the public with an opportunity to enjoy them unimpaired for future generations. Distinguished among other federal land management agencies in the United States in its commitment to preserve natural lightscapes, through technological and scientific leadership, the National Park Service Natural Sounds and Night Sky Division increases scientific understanding and inspires public appreciation of natural soundscapes and night skies. As many of you know, our night skies team, who I'm sure many of you have worked with, has been a forerunner in advancing science-based stewardship to assess, protect, and restore night skies. Recognized worldwide in the development of photic monitoring systems and analytical tools, our staff provides engineered solutions by working with partners, stakeholders, industry, and other federal agencies in the development and application of cutting edge technology for environmental sensing, modeling, data analysis, and visual presentation of night sky data. Equally important, our staff assists parks to interpret night sky resources to help the public understand the meaning and the relevance of night skies and foster their own sense of stewardship. In the National Park Service, we have a strict mandate to protect park resources and values, which includes a responsibility to actively manage all park uses so that future generations can enjoy learn and be inspired by park resources and values, which of course includes night skies. In this regard, the Park Service recognizes a naturally dark night sky as more than just a scenic canvas. It's part of a complex, complex ecosystem that supports both natural and cultural resources. Enjoyment of national parks is a fundamental part of the visitor experience and that experience is heightened when it progresses from enjoyment to understanding the significance of its natural and cultural heritage resources such as night skies and natural sounds. The night sky has inspired us for generations and national parks are some of the best places in the United States to see starry night skies, planets and neighboring galaxies. In fact, Staring at the spectacular array of stars in the night sky with the light band of the Milky Way streaking overhead is a quintessential experience for many national park visitors. Astronomy based activities are among the most popular visitor programs offered in national parks and night sky festivals often attract thousands of participants. These programs in turn provide important benefits to local, regional, and national economies. The magnificent expanse of darkness blanketed with the stars as far as the eye can see in the quiet stillness of the night instills a sense of awe and wonder that's difficult to match. Even national parks near urban areas with less than pristine conditions 
often serve as night sky sanctuaries for those that live. Oh, sorry, I lost that. For those that live in our, yes, thank you. Um, I am really sorry, my whole screen just jumped around. Okay, so the magnificent expanse of darkness blanketed with the stars as far as the eye can see in the quiet stillness of the night instills a sense of awe and wonder that's difficult to match. Even national parks near urban areas with less than pristine conditions often serve as night sky sanctuaries for those that live in our most populated metropolitan cities. A glittering blanket of stars across a vast empty sky spurs our curiosity about the past and driving us inevitably to ponder the future. For millennia, the night sky has been a collective canvas for our stories, maps, traditions, beliefs, and discoveries. For example, the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historic Park commemorates Harriet Tubman's journey, guided by the North Star to aid individuals seeking freedom from slavery. Similarly, the oral histories from Manzanar National Historic Site, where detainees found solace in the night skies during difficult times, showcases the historical significance of the night sky. And Chaco Canyon National Historic Park highlights the cultural importance of the night sky to indigenous peoples throughout millennia. Excellent and effective interpretation and education is the shared responsibility of everyone in the National Park Service. George Menendez Wright was an American Salvadorian biologist who conceived of and then first conducted the very first scientific wildlife survey for the National Park Service between 1929 and 1933. He was a pioneer in a lot of ways, but especially for his holistic approach to wildlife management issues in the National Park Service. He died in a car accident very young at the age of 31. Although his career lasted less than a decade, George Wright's many contributions to the National Park Service were as valuable today as they were a century ago. He said, and I quote, our national heritage is richer than just scenic features. The realization is coming that perhaps our greatest national heritage is nature itself. With all its complexity and its abundance of life, which when combined with great scenic beauty as it is in the national parks, becomes of unlimited value. This is what we would attain in national parks. I have a feeling George Wright is smiling down on us today, providing enjoyment, education, and inspiration. Can you imagine being fortunate enough to have that as part of your job description? Well, and not work for Disney. I can because it's a big part of mine. It's also a big part of what our closing keynote speaker, Babak Tekfrashi, does. An award-winning National Geographic photographer and outstanding science communicator, Babak Tekfrashi has captured breathtaking, breathtaking scenes of the night sky on all seven continents over the past two decades. His work aims to reveal the wonders of science to the public to preserve the natural night environment and to merge the powers of art and science. He's done so much to advance our understanding and appreciation of the cosmos. It's hard to know where to begin. So, in the beginning, he was born in Tehran. He began his journey into night skies as a teenager gazing at the moon through a telescope. It was early on that he realized he could inspire others to recognize the universality of the night sky, a unifying roof above all religions, cultures, and countries. Based on those goals, he founded the World at Night program in 2007 and today directs a team of 40 night sky photographers based in over 20 countries. The World at Night book authored by the back is published in several different languages. 
a passionate cinematographer. He also specializes in time-lapse motions and immersive media, including 360 virtual reality videos of the night sky and planetarium full dome images. He's received numerous prestigious awards, including the Leonard Nelson Award in 2009 for his outstanding contributions to scientific photography, the 2022 Royal Photography Society Award for Scientific Imaging, and National Geographic's 2022 Wayfinder Award. The International Astronomical Union honored him by naming the minor planet 276163, quote, Asteroid Tekfreshi, which is a two kilometer wide object located between Mars and Jupiter. I first met Babak five years ago at a night sky conference in New Zealand where we were both keynote speakers. Aside from the fact that I'm not a guy, I'm not Iranian, Hungarian for the record, I'm not a famous astrophotographer slash photojournalist, and I most assuredly have never had an asteroid named after me or any other celestial body for that matter. But Beck and I actually have a lot in common. In getting to know him a bit better, I realized that we actually do very similar things and we do them for very similar reasons, but in very different ways which makes the honor of introducing him that much more special for me. For one, Babak understands and appreciates the inevitable intersection of light pollution, wildlife, and the sounds of nature. He's currently focused on documenting the global impact of light pollution on wildlife through a National Geographic Society granted project called Visual Atlas of Life at Night. Through this new venture, He'll be using his superpower talents to help raise awareness and the impacts that light pollution has on wildlife and in turn, how that can affect the natural soundscape that woven together makes up the rich tapestry of the acoustic environment, which is fundamental to ecosystem health and the visitor experience in all national parks. But that's work is fueled by many passions, chief among them, the knowledge that the night sky represents a shared collective heritage for us all, a cultural legacy that knows no boundaries. He uses his extraordinary prowess in night sky photography and visual storytelling to bridge art and science, culture and nature, conservation and exploration. And he inspires us through breathtaking images that remind us of the beauty of the universe and human life on our planet. His efforts reveal the wonders of science to the public, and he teaches others how to preserve the natural night environment and connects cultures to a common interest in the night sky. Babak, it is truly a pleasure to introduce you, and I look forward to furthering our myriad collaborations. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, that was an amazing introduction, um, and it's it's great to be with um, Darkest Sky International again at one of the conferences. Uh, let me begin with how astrophotography starts. So on, on a session at nighttime, the night sky photography, which categorized in a, a few different fields, astrophotography classically was known more for telescope imaging. But now it includes also night escape photography, which is not necessarily astronomy. It could be also about the landscape of night. It could be about the animals at nighttime. But it has the element of the night sky generally. Night escape photography is much broader and um, contributes to uh, classic astrophotography because now people can have a better understanding of the scale of the objects in the night sky thanks to these more popular wide angle images. The work that I do begins right after sunset with some atmospheric phenomena such as the earth shadow or could be our nearest neighbors. So here is the crescent moon, the new moon right above the high Sierra mountains in California. Um, these are known as the minarets and they're visible from uh, the Mammoth Lakes area. So only a few minutes after sunset is the beginning of the job. Then you can have a look at 
of some of the more prominent atmospheric phenomena. This is the Earth's shadow. The blue band right above here in Grand Canyon is the shadow of our own atmosphere. Most people, in fact, don't realize uh, this blue band is caused by the Earth. Um, by the earth itself as a shadow and or it's not that visible to people because it needs very clear horizon and transparent sky but the next time you have the opportunity have a look it's uh, opposite the side of the sun when the sun is setting you look at the east and in the morning you look on the west so twice per, per day is visible later on in deep twilight when astronomical twilight happens when the sun is between 12 to 18 degrees below the horizon, in the middle of astronomical twilight, we have the Milky Way emerging in in the darkest sky. So this transition, I think, is the most pleasant experience in darkest sky, stargazing, in astrophotography, the transition from daylight to the natural night. However, when you're in cities, in light polluted areas, that transition doesn't happen at all because the, from the sunset to very brightly illuminated sky of cities, you don't see that dramatic change. You start to see a few stars, but the Milky Way never, never emerges in. Here we are in northern Kenya, in Lake Turkana, which is also known as the cradle of humankind, where some of the, our earliest ancestors are coming from between one to two million years ago. And uh, the night sky in that area is ultimately dark, is superbly dark because there is no source of major light pollution. And it's very remote. Uh, I was also a bit careful with the crocodiles on the shore. This is home to many, many Nile crocodiles. Venus was right along the center of the galaxy, almost like a supernova. So during the astronomical twilight, also the work of observatories begin. The optical observatories such as here, let me go away. This is Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And the Keck telescopes are sending lasers to the upper atmosphere in order to um, stabilize the image better, in order, in order to remove the atmospheric impact on the image of the stars, that turbulence and the disturbance. Uh, but this laser is also um, a very photogenic for an astrophotographer. Uh, however, the observatories like Mauna Kea and many other places are in um, a great danger of light pollution in na neighboring areas. Uh, some observatories deal with other things such as cultural uh, issues. For example, in Mauna Kea, the mountain is also sacred to native Hawaiian and they don't need, they don't want any more uh, construction on the mountains, and that was the major source of problem for the TMT telescope on top of the mountain. Some other observatories are dealing with wildlife restrictions and protection of the animals because they are also in very remote areas. Many of the observatories are also in the national parks, which protects the observatory from the growing light pollution because national parks are also protecting the environment both in day and nighttime and limit the amount of artificial light. So documenting the observatories worldwide was, um, has been a major part of my career, as well as many other of my colleagues in the team of the world at night. And we did many of the prominent observatories worldwide across the globe in, in the past um, 15 years, 16 years of activity of the world at night. Um, that has another impact on, on our work, which is access to very dark places. Some of these observatories are now designated under the Dark Sky International as um, Dark Sky um, Sanctuaries, so that that's kind of the darkest you can find. Some of them are not in optical part of the spectrum, like this one is almost in the radio wave, it's submillimeter. Alma radio telescopes is one of the world's highest observatories at altitude of over 5,000 meters or almost 16,000 feet. The 66 radio telescopes are um, more or less moving together in order to target one object in the sky. Working at top of this area is a bit challenging at night, not only due to the temperature, but also lack of oxygen. 
Uh, this in particular image is long exposure of half an hour. The, the another cha challenge here is that these observatories are not doing very long exposure. So the radio telescopes are usually pointing to one target for a few minutes, half an hour, and then move to the other. So you don't have much time in order to capture this in long exposure before the telescopes move to another point. But lack of oxygen uh, creates a lot of problems in high altitude. You're not sharp enough. You, there could be accidents. Uh, but one experience I notice is that at high altitude, you start to lose your vision of the night sky. So we think that the higher we go, because the less air mass is above you, you see more. That's true for your camera, but not for yourself, because the retina and brain needs the oxygen in order to process and detect the light. And I would say the optimal altitude I found for stargazing is about 9,000 feet or 3,000 meters for my body. And above that, you start to lose that vision. So the documenting observatories not includes uh, only the optical. We go to many other places around the world to, to do the job. This is in West Texas, McDonald Observatory. It is home to one of the darkest places in the continental US but however is in danger of a growing oil and gas refinery um, project, which is very, very bright at nighttime. And there's some understanding and agreement be between the observatory and the large project, uh, but it's still, you know, it's very hard to control such a large industry. Uh, one other area that um, is one of my favorites for darkest sky, um, Photography is the top of um, Haleakala in Maui, Hawaii. So the top at the edge of the caldera is about 9,000 feet. That's the optimal altitude I mentioned, 3,000 meters. Right above my head is Orion rising above the caldera. This is in early morning, around 4 in the morning, um, in a late summer night. And Orion is rising above these um, low clouds forming on the edge of the caldera. Uh, the reason for um, going to the, some of these places is not only to capture the night sky, but also the beauty of nature at night. Because from my perspective as a science communicator, as a dark sky activist, in order to open the gate of astronomy and importance of dark skies to public, you have to enter from the perspective of nature. You have to enter from the perspective of our environment. Because dark sky importance from the perspective of astronomy that we need to do science is very important, but it only matters to a smaller group of people. But protection of night sky from the angle of environment and nature, wildlife, animals, energy saving, safety, these are usually more impactful. And these images that combine earth and sky resonate with more of the viewers because they can find something in the foreground that they can relate to. Many of them have been to that crater. Many of them know the place. And now the night sky is no longer just something in the outer space, no longer the laboratory to astronomers, but a part of the life. As soon as these images reveal themselves, that night sky is just a forgotten but essential part of our nature. Now we are in the Capitol Reef National Park in Utah. Um, another dark sky designated site and a truly dark sky place. I was uh, with a colleague, Mike Shaw, and we were walking in uh, this famous gorge. It's um, home to many nocturnal species. In fact, we were using red light, as you can see, just right here. We are using red light in order to see um, some of the features around and also in order to limit the impact on the nocturnal species. It also helps the viewer um, human eye in order to see more. If you use red or yellow light, orange light, you see shadows and brightly illuminated areas much better than using white blue LEDs, which is very common for headlights, unfortunately. I'm glad that the Night Sky program under Karen um, has regulated the darkest sky sites uh, in the darkest sky parks to follow the regulations against um, light painting, very bright light painting, which impacts not only the environment for stargazers, but also for nocturnal species. Uh, 
I'm going to share with you some ideas that astrophotographers can contribute to dark sky protection. You know, as an astrophotographer, we have also a responsibility. You know, you are a wildlife photographer. You have some kind of responsibility for protection of wildlife as well. So that's why many of my colleagues in National Geographic or wildlife photographers are also activists in conservation. And photographer um, looks for an impactful legacy. And what would be an impactful legacy for an astrophotographer? What would be the responsibility? Um, the easiest connection, I would say, is protection of the night sky. But how can we achieve that? I think it's very important to see the four elements of photography that makes an image powerful. One is art. The other is technique. These are very obvious. Then comes the moment, a unique moment. And then comes the story. When the story missing, which is very common nowadays on our social media, you know, there, you see plenty of beautiful images, bright moments, but there's no story. Then the impact is gone. So in order to bring all these together, there needs to be a planning. So instead of me repeating the same image of the Milky Way over and over above a beautiful landscape, now from this perspective, I'm looking for a moment and looking for a visual story. And this is more like a narration, not only a single image. So how can I bring the story of light pollution and dark sky importance to people through my visual storytelling? And this is a mission or responsibility that easily astrophotographers can do because they all have some connections to, to the society, some higher, some lower, but even in, within your family, friends, in school, in a community meeting you have every week, this is the moment that to share your passion and your story for an impact. Um, the Creativity is another part of that. So if I'm a wildlife photographer and I go to a safari, I, do, I like to do conservation, I not only shoot and capture uh, images of the elephants, which is the most bold and uh, iconic of the wildlife in the area. And the same story in astrophotography. I not only shoot the Milky Way, I look for the creativity and diversity of the images and the foregrounds that fits my puzzle because this visual story you're going to share, it's like a puzzle. And some of these missing pieces are um, different subjects of the night sky and different perspective to the angle of your story. So let me give you some examples of how an astrophotographer can contribute to dark sky protection, can contribute to astrotourism. When I first visited the island of La Palma in 2011, uh, my goal was to capture the darkest skies and work for the observatory as documentation of their area. La Palma is home to the darkest uh, place almost in entire Europe. Uh, that's one of the best stargazing locations worldwide and home to a major observatory. Uh, astrotourism at that time was at the beginning stage. There were people coming, but there were only a few companies doing so. Uh, over the years, I did a number of workshops in La Palma, bring in people from across the planet to do this annual Astro Master class. And I also saw how the development of astro tourism is going through in this island. They started to do create miradors, the viewing point for stargazing. Another astrophotographer locally did virtual reality 360 of every single mirador and some of the houses that provide accommodation to tourists. So if you stay here, this is the night sky you're going to see in 360 degrees. You can embrace yourself there. Uh, and then later on, there were more and more companies doing stargazing tours, astrophotography, even permanent observatories that are renting telescopes worldwide through robotic equipment. So these are steps that um, eventually create a sustainable economy, which is true right now for La Palma, it's a notable percentage of their income. Um, many tourists come mainly for hiking, but a good percentage of about 10 to 20 percent on average are for stargazing. And this is really notable for uh, for a place that astrotourism is pretty uh, young in their history. And um, 
when the economy is sustainable, then protecting the night sky is a long-term um, thing that is already within the community. They embraced it. And we can see it in other places around the world, from Elki Valley to Chile, and Chile to New Mexico to Australia, that how this new emerging in industry with astrophotography, because that industry needs the visuals to communicate with public. So this is where an astrophotographer come in. Um, the images I did in La Palma had that profound impact on understanding of beauty of this island at nighttime. And the people who came to those workshops also contribute to more of that. Uh, this is a long exposure from the top of the island at altitude of 2,400 meters. It's a combined sequence of time lapse in order to create this long exposure. It was interesting that uh, you can actually see uh, just behind my head uh, the top of Southern Cross from Northern Hem Hemisphere. This is latitude of 28 degrees, and you can see three stars of the Southern Cross because the horizon is so uh, open and clear. Another program that I started some years ago in Maine is a stargazing and photography retreat annually in August. And this is another example of a combination with astrotourism. This retreat site is protecting the darkest sky. It's not a designated IDA site yet, uh, but it will be in, in future, I hope. And it's uh, doing a great job of communicating with the locals, businesses in the small town, why we need to protect the darker skies and keep the natural night environment for loons, for other species we have, which are active in nighttime. And astronomers, amateur astronomers from across the country come together with telescopes, speakers. There are two week-long week, week -long programs. One is handled by me and my colleague, Bruce Berger, and the other one by another group doing more amateur astronomy. I often take my family too, and um, my love, my son, and also my wife, Shari, are, they're both very much into astronomy and enjoying the darkest skies. Uh, this is the view of the Northern Lights from Maine, uh, another surprising fact, which is in Northern uh, North America, we can see the northern lights from very low and mid latitudes, some, sometimes uh, even 30 degrees, 40 degrees, this was 42, and just not a major geomagnetic um, storm, it was just KP4 or 5, you can see aurora on the horizon, when it hits a higher geomagnetic storm level, such as 9, aurora in Maine could be overhead, because this part of the world is sitting right below the North Magnetic Pole, which is in further north in Canada. That's why uh, you have the privilege of seeing the Northern Lights from lower latitude. Let's go on and continue with our main topic. These are three uh, towns nearby of this lake where we do the program in Maine and in the town of Washington. And I'm monitoring these towns and um, they're growing over the years but not that dramatically. But it's interesting to see uh, how these little towns are visible from such a large distance. Um, I'm also going to uh, play you a sound here. Let's see if you can. This is the sound of that lake. The sound of loons recorded I we think can't... almost the same night. You can't hear it, no? Uh, if you go to, you have to hit share computer sound. Um, and the options. Oh, okay, yeah, I will skip that. Maybe I do it during the Q&A. But there are many loons um, living in this area and they're very sensitive to light, which I will talk about more on this uh, later on here, um, just before the Q&A. Uh, but loons as a nocturnal species only go to nest in a lake where it's um, not light polluted, uh, especially not affected by these newer bright blue, uh, white, blue LEDs, uh, because they don't feel safe at nighttime in such areas. There's so many stories about nocturnal species which needs visual documentation. And that's another approach an astrophotographer can do, uh, can take to contribute to darker sky protection. One other idea is um, the opportunity that is also sustainable for the astrophotographer itself. But when you contribute to darker sky protection, I remember my colleague Wally Paholka of Southern California, he, he was doing um, 
magnificent work of national parks at nighttime for many years. And when we started the world at night in 2007, uh, we brought in this great collection of images to Tuan. One of them was captured in 2006, six, just a year before we started Tuan, of the natural bridges, national monuments in, in Utah. And this was the first darkest sky park designated by IDA in 2007. Uh, and that image by Wally had uh, an impact on registering that park, designating that park. So an astrophotographer can help with designating new places in partnership with that place. And it's not only um, a responsibility or a story to share, it also could be economically sustainable for an astrophotographer to spend time later on. Uh, it could be even a job. I, um, one good example is my colleague Miguel Claro in Portugal, and he has been an astrophotographer for a long time, but in the past 10 years or so, he started to work with the Dark Sky Alkeva project. So this is in southern, um, mid-southern part of Portugal, and the Dark Sky Alkeva official astrophotographer is Miguel now, because he has been the photo ambassador of the Dark Sky Alkeva, and their weekly workshops of people going there and doing astrophotography. So when a dark sky designated site starts, there is these opportunities for an astrophotographer, amateur astronomer to get involved and make, make it a better business in, in long term and protect the night sky in a better way. Um, so one more example was in Iceland. I started traveling to Iceland about 10 years ago and doing these workshops. Uh, but over the years, I realized Iceland, because it's a country with almost free energy, you know, everything in Iceland is expensive except for energy, because everything comes from renewable green energy. And then people uh, usually don't know exactly how much to use the energy. For example, there are greenhouses in Iceland and they're not covered, although greenhouses are very important for sustainable production of food. But at night, because they're not covered, uh, they have this massive amount of light. One single greenhouse is equivalent to like a small town of emitting lights and scattered in this humid environment. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge sky globe. And um, later on, I noticed some of the really remote areas in Iceland. Let me go away and you can have a better look at this image. This is a dam and a light, it's a safety light from a dam in the middle of nowhere with Aurora on the other side. So it's in highland of Iceland. And capturing these images, sending it to responsible people has a very good impact. So this is another approach an astrophotography can do. In fact, we send it to um, the, the companies who is in charge in, to consider switching this off or do something else because it, it has no use. It's in the middle of highlands and just one light going up to the sky for no reason. It's not even for commercial purpose. Or this one was just a friend's house and he realized after this image that you know this white blue LEDs coming from that house could be a motion sensor now because when there's nobody there, it's a vacation house. They only go there in summer why there should be this white bright light on the entire year every night of course in iceland it's very affordable for for the light and its leds but what is the reason for that we can ask that when there is a beautiful image you know he can frame this image and put it in the house but he also can ask what is the reason for that light another example was this you know light is not only for safety and security Light is used for sometime identity. Light is used for beauty. Light is used for commercial purposes. And each one has a different approach in order to communicate and um, change it in, in a better way. Santorini is a postcard island. It's beautiful in night and day, especially during the dusk, thanks to the light. But can shall, shall we put the light on the entire night when there is nobody there? This image is taken at midnight. There's no one anywhere on the streets, but the lights are now no longer beautiful. It's quite ugly, in fact, and it's a waste of energy. You lose the night to sky, 
And there's no reason for it because there's no safety or security about it now. It could be motion sensor. So there is um, no problem if you switch off the beautiful lights of Santorini after a few hours or make it more shielded and protected. While I was there, um, all of a sudden a blackout happens. I should confess that I was not responsible for that. <laughs> Some astrophotographers may do that. But uh, a blackout happened in Santorini and the power station was on fire, unfortunately. So for two nights, there was no light in the island. And in this little village in the north side of Santorini in Greece, uh, for many years, people never seen the Milky Way. Now they were sitting on these restaurants with candles and looking up to the Milky Way and they could remember their childhood. So some of these images can help to bring back those memories and ask about what can we do to, to live like that again with our modern technology without losing our 21st century way of living. Sometimes astrophotography is about the moment and the beauty and wonders of the night sky and that can be a part of that visual story as well because not every image is about light pollution. Sometimes you're limited to uh, cities, even in cities, there are celestial targets to capture. Uh, this was in Paris. So Paris is the city of light, and the moon was sitting over Champs-Élysées. But the story here is about after midnight, in fact. So in most of France, especially not the south, but north, central, and western France, many places switch off um, lights of street lights and monument lights after midnight. Even the Eiffel Tower is switched off to conserve energy after midnight. And I think this is the way to go. If you go to a village in Normandy or Brittany of Western France, you can see the Milky Way in near midnight because all the street lights are off. And it's very striking change. And it's very, I think, reasonable because nobody's using it. But if you go to a same kind of village in a neighboring country, there is not that culture yet. So I think we can move towards that. This was an image at around 3 a.m. in Paris next to Eiffel Tower. Although this is not a single exposure, it's a time-lapse sequence, but I was very surprised that the circumpolar star trail is possible within Paris, the metropolitan, thanks to switching off some of the brightest lights in the city. I'm going to share you a quick um, background of my story. This was my first telescope's first friends. We started stargazing, including my colleague Oshin Zakarian next to me, who is a still a member of the World at Night, an active astrophotographer. The first telescope was just a two and a half inch aperture reflector. And the first view to the moon in early 90s, 91 or 92, uh, was the beginning of my astronomy. The first few years was mainly long exposures. Um, even up to nine hours, this one was on film, because film was very low sensitivity. Capturing an image of the Milky Way was almost like a dream that was not possible, because every time it was either out of focus or short exposure or the star tracker didn't work. And it took me a few years until I captured my first image of the Milky Way. Now, today, with your first digital camera, even with your first smartphone, with an iPhone, Google Pixel, or similar smartphone, on a tripod, you can capture the Milky Way in the first night out. So that's a possibility that dark sky activities can use, because now we are not limited to a few dozens of astrophotographers like the 90s. We are open to thousands and thousands of people who can use smartphones and off-the-shelf digital cameras to capture the Milky Way, but they need to learn also about the story, the importance of sharing these images from the angle of protecting the darkest skies for our generation and next ones. Um, this was maybe my first um, commercial image, uh, the image of Comet Hailbub. It was an assignment for the cover of our astronomy magazine in Iran in 97. And Hailbub was one of the greatest, brightest comets of our time. Uh, we look forward to the next great comet in the Northern Hemisphere. We had one in the Southern Hemisphere in 97, Comet MacNaught, which was briefly visible in the North as well. So 
In 97, I started to work as a photographer. Then in 2007, I started the Word at Night project. We have a book in five languages. The latest one was in Chinese. And uh, the website is right here, twanite.org. We have a collection of almost like over 10,000 images of the Word at Night from uh, guest photographers and team photographers. So the, the project is going to continue, although slowly, but we're going to expand. Betty Maya of IDA is also a member of um, the Word at Night team. In the beginning of the Word at Night project in 2007, I was still in Iran. And uh, this was one of the first images I tried to capture in order to show the problem of light pollution. The two images has a similar field of view and also the similar angle. So it was very important to have that comparison. But the distance is the matter. It's about 70 kilometers or 50 miles um, and altitude. The one is in Tehran, population of 13 million, also no reason for no hope for the night sky in such a large city, but only 70 kilometers away, thanks to the altitude, now you can see the Milky Way visible. So these kind of comparison images from small distances, dark sky area and metropolitan by an astrophotographer could be very impactful for dark sky activists. A good part of the project was also about um, archaeology and world heritage sites, cultural aspect that we all share the same sky. But even using these images uh, for our one people, one sky slogan, we have also that, saw that these are very powerful in protecting the darkest skies because people can realize this relationship, can find resonate um, with the foreground. It's a world heritage site, it's an icon of a country, and then the darkest sky and night sky above it comes through a different window instead of being only for astronomers, it's part of our environment. Another example was Tikal in Guatemala, a project I did with my colleague and also IDA associates, uh, Sergio Montefar, um, photographer based in Guatemala. And this was a project for the archaeology center in Guatemala to reveal this area at nighttime to show that there is a potential for astrotourism. But it was also important because the Tik Tikal area and these temples were in, um, were possibly a place for astronomers, uh, ancient astronomers of Maya civilization to observe celestial targets, especially Pleiades, which is right on this side. Uh, and it was the marking for the calendar. Sometimes these cultural relationships helps to bring uh, more connections between people and the night of sky. Pleiades in the sky and petroglyph of uh, Native American civilization in Utah. Many places need um, some access, and um, some of them are remote areas. You need to be in national park or heritage sites. You need to have a permission. And some are even inside the cities. For example, here I didn't know in Dubai, sometimes you need a special permit to do nighttime photography on tripod. And I was addressed by a policeman a few times during that night that I have to go and get my permission. In fact, I brought my permission the next night. Uh, it was handwritten by myself and with a stamp and everything because I asked him, where can I get this permission? And he didn't know. So that was the only way to go. Um, some images come from the beauty of art. So from the perspective, this image is very striking with all the lines coming out, the colors of New England fall, the reflection and everything. But then comes the story. You can start from the art and technology aspect of the image, but the story comes later on and could be about still about light pollution because the headlights of cars is another aspect of dark sky protection, nighttime protection in general. The headlights of cars are becoming very, very bright, which is not even safe for the drivers. Uh, not only the opposite drivers who can get a glare, but also the driver itself cannot see the shadow part of the road very clearly because the white blue light saturates retina and you, you don't see the dark areas becomes peach black. While if you use yellow headlights, it's uh, potentially better, safer to see the shadows. Imagine this 
giant moose is coming to the road and you don't see it until it's on the road. So it's uh, just a quick example. This is another example of these lights. Um, a Blue Ridge LED car, LED of a car headlight is coming from a far distance in Iceland. It was really blinding, not only to my camera, also to my eyes, just to look at it. And it was still a few kilometers away. A funny story happened in my own house, previous house. We were in the condo association and I came back from a project for National Geographic about light pollution. And I came back from Death Valley National Park, back to our home, and I saw the condo association has changed the entire exterior lights, except for one. And everything was 5,000 Kelvin white, really white LEDs. And this one was, you know, this one right above my, our bedroom, next to the bedroom, shining inside the bedroom. So it took me three weeks to... Um, described the problem with my neighbors. And they were, you know, they were very kind and educated people, but they were afraid of changing the lights. And it was very educational uh, approach for me that as, as an astrophotographer, it's not only sharing the images and people can change in one night. This is very tricky because if you're living in an area which is not completely safe, people are no longer affiliated or acquainted with the dark anymore. They are afraid of nighttime and they don't care that much about the stars anymore because they can't remember that anyhow. So it takes you quite some time to provide visuals, stories, documentation to make a small change. And from this angle, I really appreciate what, what the Dark Sky International is doing, all the members around the world, because this is not an easy job. We often tell people that although um, light pollution is a global issue, it's not a problem like climate change or plastic in the ocean. That's true. You can change it very fast. But the struggle of changing the culture is take quite some efforts. And we are in the middle of that. And the visuals can certainly help. This is another example by my colleague Christoph Malin in Austria. And he was, in fact, co collaborating with this factory in Innsbruck. Uh, Zorowski, the famous Zorowski factory, and um, they are night to sky fans, and they have this beautiful Milky Way image in their factory with crystals, but they didn't know this laser, which was made for commercial purposes from the factory, is creating such a large uh, light pollution and affecting the view of everything. After this image, they had changed their mind, and it was less used after that. So this is another image I took in Germany. And if you compare the two, one is a scattering of light by a white blue LED coming from a stadium. And another one is a street light, just a yellow halogen light. Uh, and the amount of scattering is interesting to compare. So all these images, which often astrophotographers capture from artistic perspective is interesting for um, the story of dark sky protection. Another example is from the City at Night project that compares these two images from space station captured of city of Milan. One is before the change to LEDs, um, and the next one is after changing the city to white blue LEDs. So we have these images from space station. Do we have an image from the ground as well? which could be even more impactful to change and to compare these two. This is another approach that an astrophotographer can do using space images of different areas and adding their own ground images as a comparison. It could be very impactful. One other story we did for National Geographic was on uh, Las Vegas and Los Angeles as source of light pollution, and dark sky area in Death Valley National Park one of the dark, largest darkest sky parks uh, in the US. And the story started in Las Vegas. As you can see that light just in the city is coming from one casino and hotel. It's um, Luxor. Luxor is uh, like a pyramid. And the idea is that these are the spirits of ancient Egyptians going to space from middle of Las Vegas. And if you look around the light, then you will notice there are some other things. Uh, first of all, this is the brightest light that's constantly going, the brightest single light going to space from our planet. 
and it's on for every night, at least for six hours since the um, 1990s. So it's already a long time. And uh, if you calculate the amount of light coming out, it's just mind blowing. You can run probably a small hospital uh, using that light. And they are attractive to and disturbing to migratory birds uh, and bats. So any night you go there, there are really dozens or hundreds of bats flying through. These are flight paths of a few bats are captured in this short exposure. Um, and it has created its own little ecosystem of completely distracted animals there. Um, if you go away from the city, then you see another source of problem that um, the light pollution from the city is very condensed compared to any other things you have seen around, around the country. And on my uh, one side is the on this side is the Los Angeles light from almost 200 miles away, 300 kilometers. And on this side is Las Vegas. It looks like sunrise, but this is Las Vegas from 90 miles away or 150 kilometers. And some of these cities are visible up to these distances, very far distances. Um, Death Valley National Park, where I'm standing in this image, is very dark on, across the horizon, except for that side. So as we approach to uh, the last part of my talk, um, let me just give you an overview. So fragile beauty of darkness is one approach for a visual storyteller to share uh, stories on light pollution. And the other one is the environmental impact. For example, relying of life at night relationship or the UN resolution on light pollution guideline for white life. And what are the elements of that? How can I document it with my visuals? The changing face of Earth at night, so looking from space and capturing the images on the ground. So it's not only from the Milky Way and astronomy point of view. That's a good approach to start. But later on, as you grow your work, there's so many other things a photographer can do, a photojournalist can do to empower the dark sky activists with good visuals. And visual is usually a narration, not only a single image. Uh, think about it like a puzzle. And the stories of successful conservation is another part, darker sky places, in order to document that, not only to start a new darker sky place, but also look to the previous ones and how they have started the work and they are protecting the dark skies. Many of the national parks in the US and Canada are already designated as darker sky parks or in the tentative list for later on. So the next chapter of my work is the Life at Night Atlas. It's a branch of the Word at Night project, which is going to be also a long-term activity with a group of people, including biologists and researchers and other National Geographic explorers and photographers. So I invite anyone who is listening here and is uh, an expert in the field of nocturnal species uh, to contact and please contribute to this project. We are looking for stories and places to document in the next five to 10 years. And the project started in 2023. The website is just a few weeks old and we are adding one by one stories to, to the site. Uh, let me give you a few examples of things that's done. One is about the migratory birds and birds in general, their relationship to animals. As you probably know, about 80% of migratory birds in North America are migrating at nighttime because it's safer, it's more energy efficient to travel at nighttime. And they are using, as well as the magnetic field of the Earth and landmark, landmarks on the planet, they're using celestial navigations. They have this um, constellations, uh, their own constellations and figures of the stars in the brain which is then genetically passed on and uh, they can follow. One, one good example is Arctic Tern. You know, this bird is flying from Antarctica to Arctic in about two weeks. It's like 1000 kilometer or more per day. And in such a short distance, so there needs to be a very good navigation system in order to do that. And light pollution can have a very profound impact on that because if you if they lose just a couple of days by going down towards the sky glow to a city, they sometimes never reach the destination because the energy is very important for this little bird. And many of them, of course, 
go down to the cities and they, they get hunted by predators already in the cities, such as cats or falcons and other larger birds of prey, or get lost or impact the source of life. So we are generally talking about many, many millions of birds, migratory birds impacted, but bird visuals. You know, as I read these stories and look for the visuals, and there's almost none with thousands of astrophotographers worldwide, we never documented that very boldly. So why not? You know, it's not as beautiful as capturing as the Milky Way to capture the dying birds, but you can have a different perspective to it. For example, birds flying over major cities at nighttime. Although it was very challenging 10, 10 years ago, but now with current technology of low light cameras, we can do that much easier. This is one example by my colleague Ajay Talwar, uh, our Indian photographer. And if you look at this long exposure of Sydney Opera House, it shows you all these birds trapped by the light. Some are local and they're using this environment of very rich in insects at nighttime as their uh, source. And some are migratory birds who are coming down captured by these bright lights, which is shining to the sky partially. You know, the project I did recently with my colleague Oshin Zakarian for Life at Night was in Pinnacles National Park of California. These are the pinnacles just behind me and darkest sky side of this place is just magnificent. We were there mainly to capture one kind of bats. And the bats appeared, um, let me show you a complete image. Bats appeared in this long exposure image, it was uh, flash illuminated to capture both the foreground and background. Um, and um, the flash was at the lowest speed, so you can capture these trails of the bats with the darkest sky in, in 10, 20 seconds of exposure. But then we realized there is uh, the image that was supposed to show bats in another location of the park was photobombed by these caravan of lights traveling across the horizon and the sky. It was quite bright, you know, I would say magnitude uh, one to two, even magnitude zero at the brightest. And this was a newly launched group of Starlink satellites in the sky. As I stacked them together in one image, because it's a screenshot of video that you can find on my YouTube channel. Um, this is the result after the stack at the high ISO. So it shows it brighter than the human eyes can see. But if you were shooting with um, a small telescope, small field of view, um, it could be even much brighter, completely dominate the image of, of, the, um, of the deep sky object. Uh, so many of you are familiar with um, the problem of constellations of satellites, the small satellite projects, and the future of astronomy in dark skies. It's also in hand of some of these satellites, although they're not necessarily visible to unaided eyes, like the starlings when they reach the optimal altitude, they're magnitude six or seven, barely visible to unaided eyes. But for an astrophotographer, for astronomers, they are easily captured in short exposure. And some of these projects are going to be boldly visible to human eye, like the Blue Walker tree and the next generation of these network coverage, uh, giant uh, satellites. The satellite itself is not that giant, but the large panel it has, uh, it will reflect a lot of light. And we don't know what would be the actual brightness. Uh, photographers and experts are monitoring that. So this is another approach that an astrophotographer can do in order to contribute. This is an image from uh, the Black Canyon National Park, the Black Canyon of Gunnison in Colorado, where uh, I did it in 2018, and I was very surprised by the number of satellites and planes. Uh, at that time, Starlink didn't start it yet. So between now and then, uh, in the past five years, the number of satellites has tripled because of the active satellites we have in Starlink alone is more than 4,500. And the number of planes increased as well. So this is the challenge of uh, astrophotography, which is going to be even more prominent in the next years. Uh, a part of the project is also about glowing the dark animals, such as bioluminescence uh, in the ocean. Uh, this was in Oman, a beach which is known for turtles. 
This beach was open to public in the past, but after after a while, they realized in order to protect the turtles, they need to switch off the lights, take away the hotel and accommodation to further distance and make the beach completely conserved and preserved with only limited number of people going now. Now the turtles are back and they do their nesting there, hatching is successful. And the reason is um, these turtles need dark beaches in order to safely go there. Otherwise, you know, many of them return to the same beach they're born. And when, when the baby sea turtles are coming out, that's another part of the problem because they look for brighter horizon. And that's often, um, unfortunately, with artificial light is the reverse side. Instead of going to the ocean, they go inland towards the hotel with street lights and uh, all the activity of human being. Uh, but in natural world, the brighter horizon is always the ocean. It's brighter than the sand and the bushes. So an astrophotographer can help document these for protection of the darkest skies. And when I was looking around for some good documentation of that, I didn't find it. So the reason Life at Night project is started is to fill that gap. Another recent project was in Great Smoky National Park. Great Smoky is in South Carolina and large areas of it is in Tennessee. And we started from Tennessee side we went to an area where um, the synchronous, uh, synchronized fireflies are living. There are more than 20 species of fireflies in the Great Smoky, but this group um, synchronized their light together. Every eight seconds, they light and then switch off for eight seconds. Uh, it's still not clear what is the benefit of um, synchronizing the light. But um, it's very breathtaking when you are in the forest, all the forest lights up for one or two seconds and darkness in eight seconds and all of a sudden lights up again. And capturing that was a truly remarkable experience for me. But I was not expecting to see so many people and cars around because the area where the synchronous fireflies are active is next to a parking lot of Cancro. And the parking lot during the time between, you know, beginning of the night until 10, 11 is just filled with cars going back and forth and the headlights of cars on, on, on the fields with the fireflies. But people are respecting um, by using red lights or no lights. That was very interesting. The National Park Service did an excellent job of providing information to people that how to minimize the impact on fireflies. And that's why they're still there, they're growing. But I think the cars were a problem. I documented another group of fireflies are more sensitive to natural darkness and light, and they're known as blue ghosts. Uh, they're crawling near the ground. And as soon as there was a headlight of car, there was no light. I did a time lapse of that session. As soon as the headlight um, lit the forest, they stop for several seconds. They're confused. They don't communicate anymore. And you know, the light is for mating. And it's an essential part of communication. This is a fisheye image. Um, let me go around. The fisheye image of um, a camera which is placed on the forest bottom, looking upward and include the entire sky above me uh, with fireflies above the lens. Uh, over 45 minutes activity of synchronous fireflies. Uh, closer up image of that, and you can find even a virtual reality option of that on my YouTube channel, I think. This is um, a glow-in-the-dark fungi, a mushroom, which was very surprising. I was walking around and saw a few of them. These are um, just over here. These are the glow worms. Uh, they're very faint and in higher altitude areas of the park. So these are the places you can see more of my work. I hope um, you enjoyed it. Um, the, the email in order to contact me if you have uh, some ideas for the Life at Night project. And um, the YouTube channel and IG is just the same uh, place. My website has a larger collection that my images, Tuan website, which I already introduced, has collection of all the team, as well as our book. We also have um, a major contribution to an app called Windowsite. This is a TV app that you can see art on your own TV. And I have almost 600 images there, plenty of dark sky activities um, 
for future people who are going to use this app. It's a new platform for artists and art lovers worldwide, which I highly recommend. I use it all the time at home to inspire my family, not only with the work on myself, but with many other National Geographic photographers who are contributing. So if there is time for question and answers, I'm more than happy to go through that. Thank you so much, Babak. That was sure. such a beautiful presentation. And I really appreciate the sensitivity with which you approach like communicating through imagery and how much you consider the audience of the images as well. It's one thing to read about what we're losing because of light pollution, but it's another thing to see it documented so carefully visually. Thank you. So we do have a few questions from the participants. Uh, Mark asks, I see so many long exposure images of Milky Way that the naked eye never sees. How can we get photographers to capture the natural human visual experience? That's a very good question and an important aspect in which um, I didn't enter it on this talk, but usually my talks have a section about how to avoid faking the images. So fakery of astrophotography have several approach. Of course, if you talk about deep sky photography, that's one side because then it's based on the stacking images and making composite. But landscape photography of night or night escape is often within documentary photography of nature. And in documentary photography, we do not add anything or remove anything. If there is no moon in this picture, I don't add a moon because you know it's empty here or here. I don't add a moon over there because it didn't exist. Moon is like an element such as an elephant or lion. You know, you don't add a lion on top of an elephant if it doesn't exist in nature. So this is the same. If moon was not there, we're not going to add it. You can't remove that star cluster above my head. So if you consider this documentary photography, then you're limited. If you are art photographer and consider this fine art photography, then you're open to anything, of course, because photography is not limited to documentary. But people usually perceive this kind of photography documentary, and that's kind of the tricky part. And if they lose the trust of what is visible in these images are the real, it's going to negatively impact our dark sky protection because then they don't believe this night sky is there. Why should I protect it? Because it's just fake, it's in Photoshop. And this question, although it's not about composites of daylight and nighttime images, it has the same sense because many photographers do not see that limit. They easily add an image of the Milky Way from another place over another foreground or image of the place in daytime over an image of nighttime and combining without clear information to the audience or making the image of the Milky Way with a tracked long exposure with all the nebulosity visible over a foreground, people see, can we really see this in the darkest sky area? Then they go to that darkest sky area and there is nothing visible. <laughs> then, you know, the, the, you make the expectations so high that they get depressed and we are losing that um, impact at that moment. So I think it's very important to talk about this in astrophotography workshops and darker sky community areas that, of course, we need astrophotographers to support us, but let's create more um, human level images as well. For example, well, human can, no, can never see the Milky Way in color, but the camera is going to record that. I'm not going to remove the color of the Milky Way because human eyes cannot see it. But I will give that information over and over. If you look at the Milky Way, it's stunning, but there is no color because our eyes cannot see color of diffuse low light objects. And retinal cone cells are only activated when there is concentrated light. Otherwise, the rods are color blinded. You know, it's a very easy information to share an astrophotographer can educate the audience by telling the truth about the images and avoiding saturated or so-called ultra-cooked 
um, images is a good approach um, to make more realistic documentation of the night sky. Thank you for asking that question. There was a follow-up to this question that said, isn't the point of photography to capture things the human eye can't see or see for long? So science, really yes, this is science photography. But if we are talking about documentary photography, then you also capture things which are rare. For example, you go to a safari in Kenya and you're looking for this rarely seen animal. Um, you go to astrophotography mission and you capture this rarely seen atmospheric phenomenon known as red sprite. You know, of course, human eyes can see it if you're there, but you, you will reveal more color, more details. But, you know, there, there is no um, Milky Way over San Francisco. If I combine that in an actual image and show the audience, I managed to capture Milky Way above Los Angeles tonight from downtown L.A. And you know this this is wrong. If I capture Milky Way from Northern Hemisphere, add it to a foreground of Southern Hemisphere, these are the problems. These are the lines. Um, unless it's for a project, unless for a reason, unless it's for science, for example, I'm combining Northern Hemisphere sky and Southern Hemisphere Hemisphere sky in one composite to show the people how the Milky Way is extended around our planet. This is for a project. And then it has a meaning, reason. But without that, uh, fakery of astrophotography is a major concern at the moment. Okay, that was a really good answer. Thank you. Um, we have some questions uh, about how to exhibit photographs. Leticia asks, uh, I'm interested in ways to exhibit photographs and paintings with subtle dark tones that are washed out in ordinary light. The eye has to be surrounded by darkness in order to see celestial objects or twilight tones, such as particular shades of blue that reflected from the ocean waves after the sun sets. Even if you see an image on an electronic screen, if there's light in the room, it will be like light pollution. Do you have any suggestions? Yes, it, it depends. It depends on the ambient light. Well, and it's also, you know, there's many settings you can adjust. There are also some companies who provided art frames which are one-to-one -one like a print. Um, and also on your own TV or light box, you can adjust things that make the image more real and less bold. But you can never reach that human perception experience, unfortunately, not even with prints, because with prints, also you lose some of the contrast and brightness. So I, I wouldn't go exactly towards that um, approach that I like to give exactly the same perception because even perception from one person to the other is different. Um, some people can see more of the tonality, some people can see less colors. And, you know, I, it, it's a very confusing area, but it's definitely there are ways to do this digitally by screens, by reducing the brightness, adjusting the right exposure using higher, higher quality screens. Uh, for prints, my preferred way of doing some of the images is on metal, uh, metal print, because it has more um, contrast and sharpness compared to some other medium, especially if the image needs to be on glossy paper, glossy surface. Uh, some of the dark images on matte surface, uh, they lose the contrast. Uh, but, you know, some people also consider reflection free prints, which are matte and fine art prints are their preferred. Uh, but metal has been my one of my main um, medium in order to do the exhibits. Okay. Um, another question about exhibitions, but from a different perspective. Today asks, could you share some thoughts on how astrophotography displayed in an exhibition setting can go beyond beauty and inspiring awe? and instead actively foster a sense of urgency toward preserving biodiversity, which is a crucial aspect of dark sky conservation efforts. Yeah, in 2011, we did a digital exhibit in Ars Electronica Center in uh, Linz in Austria, uh, the World at Night project. And uh, the whole museum was uh, featuring variety of light pollution aspects. And there's one other 
exhibit at the moment, which um, I highly recommend for people to visit in Washington, D.C. I was in charge of the images, as well as my other colleagues in the world at night. It's in a natural uh, history museum, Smithsonian, on the second floor. Um, it's going to be there until March 2025, and it's highlighting all the aspects of dark skies and light pollution. And if you have a look at these examples, like in 2011, we had a globe of the Earth where people could interact. I think interaction um, is changing it from a fine art gallery where people are there to buy prints. We are inviting people to impact them, so they need to interact with the images more. And uh, on that globe, they could touch it and go to different places to see how the Earth looks at nighttime from the ground, how light pollution is visible, for example, in Shanghai, and how dark is Gobi Desert. So that comparison as an interactive tool, I think it's um, it's filling the gap. Or in, in the Smithsonian Gallery, if you go, we have these panels of the images where you can see the Bortle sky based on examples of the images or uh, many interactive tools that the gallery managers has added. It's uh, quite remarkable. We had one other in Qatar in 2013, instead of typical exhibits of, of framed images or on the wall, we use banners, very tall banners. And it was like a story where the kids are going through these roads of banners and seeing these different vertical images. There are many ideas in order to make it more interactive or combine the exhibit road, the, the root of the exhibit with the scale model of the universe or a scale model of time, scale model of the solar system, uh, depending on the age um, focus of the audience if it's mainly for schools or adults, if it's um, in, in a developed world or it's more needs to be culturally aligned uh, in another country. So there are all these tricks to add to an exhibit to make it more educational, but I would say interaction is the key. Yeah. Okay. Um, one last question, I think in the interest of time, um, and I think this is something that everybody's curious about. Could you please play your audio of the lake? Oh yeah, now we can do. So I'm playing on on a phone in order to let me see if it's um I think it's going to be still the same issue. Can you hear it? No. No, no. Yeah, this is the new AI of Zoom. It's uh canceling out any <laughs> um, any sound which is not recognized as myself. <laughs> so in order to do that, you have to share a video through share a screen. But if you have a look on my um, Instagram or YouTube or just search Babak Tafrishi loons, you will find it. It's a, a sound of loons captured during a long exposure of 20, 30 seconds from that lake in Maine. And um, I that was the beginning of story of my connection with the loons and how how it's missing the visuals of loons at night. If you Google, there is no actual image of these animals at nighttime under stars. You know, there are some black images of the animals, but showing the environment of night to sky and loons and as they call, we have the technology to capture. I'm very surprised that nobody did. So there's so many visual gaps that can we can fill as photographers to fulfill um, the effort of dark sky activists. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Babak. I have to stop the questions here so that we're on schedule. But I just want to extend a big thank you to you for just the most beautiful end to this year's conference. Thank you. Um, now, I would like to hand it over to Ruskin Hartley, who is the executive director of Dark Sky International, just for some final thoughts. Well, thank you, Samyukta, for helping close us out. And, and, and thank you, Babak. Uh, for sharing your inspiring images and words. It was one of my great pleasures over the summer to actually be out on that lake with you and hear the loons in person under a dark sky. So thank you for sharing your work. And I'm really excited for you to extend your work beyond capturing incredible images of the Milky Way to capturing the impact that the night sky and light pollution is having on the natural world at life, the wildlife. I'm really excited to follow uh, this project. 
Um, in closing us out, I just I wanted to share a few thank yous. And first, uh, Bertie Marif and Michael, if you can help highlight all the staff who've been working so hard behind the scenes to put on this remarkable conference. I am so honored uh, to work with all of you. Um, we are a small and mighty team, and I think we put on one of the best virtual conferences out there. So Betty Meyer is really the point person in charge of all of this, but she could not do it without everyone else, without Amber and Michael and Drew, and who else do we have here with us? And, and um, and Brian and Melissa, and so give everyone a big wave. And uh, Alison, uh, we are up, have been up for the last 24 hours to pull this together for you, and it is our honor. I'm already looking forward to next year after we have a little bit of sleep. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And Roy, you, Roy, you joined us recently as well. So it's just wonderful and honor to work with all of you. Give everyone a wave. Thank you, it's an honor. And I wanted to share a little bit about uh, just a couple of thoughts about what's coming up. I mean, it has been really inspiring to hear all of the stories from around the world. When we started this conference four years ago, we wanted to accomplish a couple of things. We wanted to inspire people with stories from the field, to hear from as many different countries as we have. And we have done that this year. And we've heard, I think, from people from 20 countries around the world. And we wanted to give engage, develop engagement workshops to give you tools and resources that you can take forward in your advocacy. That's why we had a workshop about astrotourism, because that's a really a critical part of valuing dark skies. It's why we heard from the team around what a better lighting practice is. Uh, and it's why we pulled together a policy panel to sort of, okay, how do you take this work forward? Uh, I think the policy panel in ended last, and, and really it's policy that we want to put at the center of this work going forward. And I think one of the, the takeaways from the end of that one is pick up the phone and make the call, take the steps that you can at home, but then involve your neighbors and pick up the phone and get your elected officials on the phone, get them involved in this, tell them why this is important to you, connect it to the values uh, 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 of your community. Um, our commitment is to help you support in self support provide better support in that effort as well. Uh, Brian has joint legal has joined us to help develop our responsible outdoor light at night education program, so we can give you the tools and resources you, for you to be effective advocates, both for you no know, what is the impact of light pollution, but critically what are the solutions uh, out there. That's why we're going to be developing application guidance. If you need to light your roadway, how do you do it from a dark sky perspective, from a more responsible perspective? We have guidance, for instance, for sports fields. We want to build on that to provide other guidance for other common lighting situations out there so that we can provide that guidance and so that people can also be recognized when they go above and beyond. And we're also committed to really focusing and moving, leaning into this area of kind of policy and collaboration. We're working hard with Shalana and 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 um, David from Bug Life and others to sort of really concept what would a global coalition for defending the night sky look like. Uh, a lot of this work can be done regionally. A lot of it can be done at cities and counties and states, and at the country level. Um, and, and we want to provide tools and frameworks for that. But as Babak shared in his video that he took in the Pinnacles, some of the challenges the night sky require a global coordinated approach. That is going to be challenging, but it's a challenge we're willing to take on. Um, Babak's image that he shared, I think over the summer, of the Starlink train going across the Pinnacles is one of the most widely shared videos on, the, on National Geographic social platforms. So people are concerned about this. They want to know how they can be part of a solution to this. Um, I wanted just to highlight a couple of stories that really jumped out to me uh, as I close up here. So, so, so one was Daniel Bullitt um, from the Kaibab Paiute tribe of Indians here in the Western part of, of North America, shared the story of helping his community become the first dark sky nation, first a tribal nation in the world and how that led to the return of the bighorn sheep, something that is really an important part of their culture and their heritage. But not only did it bring the animals, the physical animals back, it led to a rejuvenation in their culture because that animal is such an important part of their culture and their history. And it has led to the sort of reclaiming some of that heritage and it just brought it full circle how Reclaiming the night sky is such an important part of both our environmental heritage and our shared cultural heritage. 
And I wanted to close by kind of going back to where we started uh, with the remarkable keynote that Joe Marchand shared. I'm gonna close by sort of paraphrasing um, so, uh, some of the words that she shared with us. She said, the stars matter. The stars matter now more than ever as we're experiencing so many challenges. We need to rediscover our connection to the cosmos and recognize the stars as a crucial part of our environment. We need all in the connection it inspires. So thank you for joining us over the last, I think it's actually 25 and a half hours now. Many of us take awe in both the night sky, but I certainly take awe personally in the connections that come together around this dark sky community. It really is a global community coming together under one sky. So thank you. I think I'm gonna turn it back, I think either to Samyukta or Betty Meyer to share future opportunities for engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raskin, for wrapping up this amazing 25 and a half hour journey. And also thank you to the Dark Sky team for the staff for working so hard to make this conference accessible from everywhere in the world. And to the participants, the speakers, the hosts, the workshop facilitators, and the attendees for being here to share your time, your point of view, and to inspire us and to be inspired. Um, while this is the end of the conference, it's certainly not the end. There's so much more on the horizon. Um, the next thing we have coming up in 2024 is International Dark Sky Week. This will be between April 2nd and 8th. And we hope that you can use the momentum, the inspiration and the connections that you've made at this conference to start planning the events that you can do to commemorate International Dark Sky Week next year. Uh, our next Under One Sky conference will be between November 8th and 9th. And we hope to see and hear from even more of you by then. And we can't wait to see the progress that we'll all have made in the Dark Sky Movement by then. There are also some ways for you to get involved immediately and harness this momentum that we've all built up over the last day. You can join our newsletter where we'll send you news and updates regularly about dark skies. You're also welcome to join our advocate network. This is a global community of volunteer advocates who are uniting to protect the dark. Um, it's a big fight, but you don't have to do it alone. And being part of this network provides you with a lot of support and information, and it can really help to keep you going when things get tough. You can also sign up to be a member of Dark Sky International. Your donation supports Dark Sky in many ways, and you also get access to a lot of membership perks, including the monthly Nightscape magazine, which is a really beautiful publication. We also encourage you to swing by the Dark Sky store to pick up some merchandise. We have t-shirts, cups and caps and lots of things with our beautiful new logo. And we also have some special conference t-shirts. Um, so head on over there. And if you're a member, you get a discount at the store. So that's another reason to sign up. There's also a survey, um, an event survey should be available to you now. And if you fill out the survey fully, you'll be entered to win one of our beautiful Under One Sky t-shirts. So we encourage you to fill that out as soon as you can. And once again, a big thank you to all of you. Let's continue to learn, to connect, to explore new horizons all under one sky. Thank you so much. Bye. Mm -hmm.